we're recording it's live uh so welcome everyone and on behalf of the pjsa i'm i'm hosting this conference session i'm also a participant in the conference session and in case you aren't aware it's the topic is telling other people's stories navigating narrative responsibility and uh, i i don't know that it was presented this way in the in the book, but this is actually meant to be a conversational space. So we, the presenters, haven't pulled together extensively long presentations in order to provide time and space for us to all share our own contributions to this really thorny topic of navigating ethical responsibility in 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 conflict narratives. So um, we're going to do a little bit of frame. I'm going to do a little bit of framing and then I'm going to pass it off to Lisa and Michael, who are then going to ground us in some cases um, in asking some some of the tough questions around how we navigate um, this narrative responsibility that we're questioning and grappling with together. Um, in true conference fashion, I'll apologize for the reading that I'm doing. Um, but it is happening. Um, so uh, I just to tell you a little bit about myself. So my name is I should actually introduce the all the speakers at this point. It's I'm Allison Castell and I'm an assistant professor of rhetoric and communication at Regis College in Denver. Um, do you want to introduce yourself, Lisa? Um, sure. Uh, I am a visiting research fellow at the Kroc Institute for International Peace Studies at Notre Dame. And Michael? Uh, I am the associate director and primary instructor for the Peace, Conflict, and Security program at the University of Colorado Boulder. Great, thank you. And um, so I'm, although I'm a professor of rhetoric and communications, my background is in conflict analysis and resolution with a specialization in narrative. So my aim here is to really just give a global perspective, um, which actually is anchored in my own personal perspective. So that's the way it goes. Um, and starting off with, you know, what we might hold as obvious in this in, in, in this context here where we're talking about narrative, narrative responsibility, which is that stories matter. Stories are important, they're critical, and they provide the framework uh, around which we understand ourselves and others and how we ought to live. And this in turn has a direct effect in our approach to our lives, our behaviors, and our engagement with others in the broader society. The way that narratives operate has implications for interpersonal relationships, but also the development of local, national, international policy for what gets privileged and what gets valued in society, gravely affecting how certain bodies move through the world more freely than others. Stories are also analytic tools that connect individual experience with systemic analysis and can reveal the dynamics of power in conflict. How self and other are constructed by and within stories reveals such dynamics. However, all stories are partial as evidenced by how they're told in conflict situations. Conflict narratives are oversimplified and characterized by extreme accounts of self and other where the self is legitimized and considered righteous and the other is delegitimized and evil. As conflict analysts, educators, practitioners, it's our job to work with such stories and to uncover what has been lost in the partial telling in order to avoid violence. This is a critically important task and is obviously not straightforward. So what is our responsibility as conflict resolvers, as practitioners, as educators, as researchers to the stories that we hear and tell? Is it the positionality of the teller that is most important to consider? Or is it just that the story be told and examined? When we find the crux, the critical importance of the story, is it rather an imperative to tell the story no matter who we are, that it isn't a matter of whether we tell it, but how we tell it? So lately, I've been hanging on the words of Audre Lorde uh, from an excerpt from Sister Outsiders. And it's called The Transformation of Silence into Language and Action, 
In it, she shares that her realization that remaining silent will not protect us or save our lives and that we have an imperative to speak out against injustice, to tell stories regardless of how we identify. And she implores, and I'll quote her, that we not hide behind the mockeries of separations that have been imposed upon us and which so often we accept as our own. For instance, I can't possibly teach black women's writing. Their experience is so different from mine. Yet how many years have you spent teaching Plato and Shakespeare and Proust? And as I sit with this question from her, I, I, want, I grapple with myself, how does this imperative apply to me and to my field as a conflict scholar? Knowing that not all stories are equal, some are valued more than others, some benefit from wide visibility and legitimization while others do not. Do we have the same responsibility to all stories to engage or to engage in the labor of finding ways to tell stories seldom told or untold that live in fear of being decimated, the ones that challenge the status quo? This is an ethical question central for conflict resolution practitioners, scholars, and educators. As we consider particular sites of storytelling, whether we're doing research, whether we're in the classroom or during a mediation, how can we be attentive to the narratives that are subjugated or that are casualties of longstanding status quo master narratives that govern what is normative or considered common sense? What if we are asked to be compassionate to the master narrative? More than notions, words, or thoughts, narratives eventually become material. They allow us to see and do some things while also governing and regulating what we can see and do. We are indexed, individually we're indexed by a set of cultural stories and positioning and conflict. And we also index people in a moral space that's marginalized and that ends up leading to the struggle for legitimization as people try to reposition themselves within those stories. So from, from this perspective, in conflict resolution, power lies not necessarily in certain individuals or groups that can impose their will onto others, but it lies in the discourses, the discourse that shapes how we account for human nature, how we define conflicts, and how we describe peace and conflict resolution. And these, these discourses aren't static, they, they do change over time in response to world events and changing norms. So the question comes up and how do we be how are we to be ethical as we work with stories is it to challenge master narratives by telling the subjugated stories without tokenizing without stepping out of our bounds without playing the hero but recognizing and not shirking our responsibility and is that responsibility equal to task as conflict resolution processes would have us believe you know and i'm i'm talking there about the focus on process Some of the ethics that I'm talking about here in this sense don't only apply to putting the onus on a speaker for raising their voice against a powerful master narrative, but as conflict scholars and practitioners, we are inextricably responsible as ethical listeners to recognize our listening as partial and interpretive and hold ourselves accountable to the stories that we are hearing and subsequently sharing. So, uh, you know, in my view, we could hold a whole conference just trying to examine some of these ethical quandaries and the associated questions um, depend that emerge depending on the context in which we're, we're speaking. Uh, the express work, however, of narrative and conflict is to move from simple stories that delegitimize that delegitimize other to more complex narratives that can pay, convey a higher regard for other. So the idea is that complex narratives, the more complex the story, the more pathways that open up in order to for new understandings to emerge, for new possibilities to emerge, for the material social processes that can follow to emerge. So in my work, in order to build complexity around narratives and to understand the partiality of narratives in my teaching, I teach conflict communication, storytelling for social justice and dialogue facilitation. And in those classes, I ask students to consider why they are telling a story in the particular way that they are. What are they choosing to omit? What are they choosing to privilege? What are they choosing to include? And what language are they using and what framing are they using? 
And I also ask them, and we, we, we examine master narratives and I ask them, what are the master narratives they may be feeding into or actually seeking to shift in others? Um, in the context of field work, where I've done field work, you know, uh, in various places, but in Colombia and the US, I might add some questions about what am I noticing about the stories that can be told and can't be told and why, and perhaps what stories are people trapped in that they're having, a, that they can't get out of. I may even add some additional questions um, about how the broader conflict is being framed and what ways of framing are gaining currency in the context and, and why, and what ways of framing don't have any currency and why, and who's setting the terms for those kinds of conversations, and what do those framings enable or constrain. So it's a million, I know that's a lot of questions and you know we're gonna get at some of this more granularly, I think. As we engage in the struggle for meaning with stories, especially in conflicts that we might not be part of ourselves, how do we find our voices within the stories to tell them ethically, recognizing our own social locations and our points of view? You know, what is our responsibility? I personally see my role as a in, as a participant in identifying the subjugated stories, the concealed stories, the hidden transcripts, and to help them rise and gain purchase and to be legitimized. However, even that is extremely tricky business. And so I give you that framing yeah, as I pass the proverbial microphone um, to my colleagues who um, come from different, or co are going to come from different perspectives, grounding us in their cases. Um, Lisa's gonna talk a bit about her work with migrants and Michael's gonna talk a bit about his work as an educator of students of conflict resolution, peace and conflict studies. Um, and the questions that they raise are gonna be very different because this is a vast um, topic that we're endeavoring into. Um, and I'm not going to say any more. I'm going to let them tell their own story. Um, and then I think, Lisa, you're going to start, right? Yeah, I think so. Great. Okay, cool. All right, so uh, my name again is Lisa McLean. Uh, I'm currently at the Kroc Institute for International Peace Studies uh, at Notre Dame, and I'm a recent graduate from the Carter School for um, Peace and Conflict Resolution at George Mason. Uh, I also wrote some notes because I, I have a tendency to kind of get off track and there's just so much to cover here and I want to cover a lot because these questions just raise so, as, as Allison was pointing out, this broader question of narrative responsibility takes us in so many different directions. And I'm going to be reflecting on some of the um, ethical dilemmas that I've, I have right now and I continue to grapple with as I prepare um, publications based off of my doctoral research. So um, my doctoral research project was a multi-sided ethnography analyzing the transnational activism of a group of Central American women who traveled to Mexico each year to search for their loved ones who disappeared along the migrant route. And so these women participate in an annual action called um, the Caravan of Central American Mothers of Disappeared Migrants. And I traveled with the caravan uh, for in two years, in 2017 and 2018 and uh, visited the local collectives of relatives of disappeared migrants in Central America in the intervening months between those, those two caravans. So I uh, approached my doctoral research from a feminist perspective and from a perspective that was particularly concerned with questions of representation and uh, the dominant discourses that circulate about migration and about migrants in the United States. In the US, the subject of Central American migration is located largely at the nexus of these competing discursive claims of crisis. Uh, voices across the political divide seek to define the terms of the present so-called migrant crisis unfolding at the US-Mexico border, be it a crisis of national security on the one hand or a humanitarian crisis on the other. Anti-immigrant interests draw upon racist and gendered discourses of otherness and threat to position Central American migrants as representing an existential secu and national security threat to the United States. And so we see this 
um, most clearly in the past couple of years and the discourses that emanate from the White House that seek to um, construct Central American migrants in particular as uh, representing an invasion to the United States or as um, uh, this criminal national security threat that must be kept out. Um, many liberal and progressive voices, on the other hand, have sought to challenge this discourse by insisting that migrants are a vulnerable population that is in need of protection by the state. And a lot of very important investigative work has been done by journalists and by researchers to account for the violence that migrants are exposed to while in transit, as well as the conditions that have led to the ongoing exodus of Central Americans that continues to today. The portrayal of migrants as a vulnerable population in many ways serves as a much needed corrective to the sensationalist and sensationalistic and racist portrayals of migrants as a national security threat and positions migrants as legible within the ever shrinking legal framework of asylum in the United States that has shrunk even further under the um, Trump administration. Despite this, um, Representations of migrants as a vulnerable population tends uh, to erase migrants' agency and political subjectivity. And these, uh, these framings of migrants as a vulnerable population are liable for co-optation by the state as a justification for the expansion of state power and control over migrants' lives as a form of paternalistic pr uh, protection, which often takes the form of the further militarization of borders, which we've seen evidence of this happening uh, under the Obama administration, for example. This is also uh, something that we see a lot in Europe, in uh, European countries, um, justifying or framing the further militarization of borders as uh, a needed response in order to protect migrants uh, from making the, well, to protect migrants by uh, convincing them not to make the journey or deterring them not to make the journey by making the journey itself so much more difficult and deadly. So in light of this, my, uh, my approach to this study was critical of how these dual discourses have been used to promote militarism, as well as how they erase or obscure migrant agency and political subjectivity. I focused my project and my research questions, not solely on uh, providing an accounting of migrants' vulnerability to harm in transit, but on the grassroots organizing of the relatives of disappeared migrants as a means to elevate a counter hegemonic discourse of migrants and their families as political agents and as agents of transformation. These are the stories that I seek to elevate in my dissertation and the publications that come out of my dissertation. So while my dissertation or my research intentionally focused on questions of agency, I nonetheless had to engage in ethical questions around the representation of violence as the context from which these protests emerged. And it was really in this space that I felt myself having to walk multiple fine lines in terms of my, my choices related to narrative responsibility, or at least these are some of the questions that really rise to the surface for me when I think about um, these ethical dilemmas around narrative responsibility. So in a context in which migrants struggle to be legible and recognized within an ever more restrictive asylum system, narration around insecurity and the causes of displacement are also increasingly politicized. Within our field, it's widely understood that structural and direct violence are in many ways mutually reinforcing. Yet within the legal framework of asylum or the, the legal framework of asylum itself narrows the discursive landscape to speak about these variable forms of insecurity by demanding the narration of a particular kind of victimhood and vulnerability in order to be legally recognized as in need of protection. These constraints of the asylum system work in tandem with political interests that seek to paint all Central Americans as economic migrants and not as refugees. And I saw these dynamics play out um, during the caravan of mothers as testimonies of persecution by state and non-state actors were prioritized in the women's public speeches over stories that were related to displacement due to the effects of deep structural precarity. In my own inter interviews with families, I found that even among families whose loved ones had fled due to um, direct threats or experiences of violence, um, when I spoke with the families, they would often describe the lack of opportunities, widespread corruption, and the inability for people to see a future for themselves in their homes as the most significant problems that have led to the exodus. 
As I set out to write the dissertation, however, I really grappled with how to speak to the significance of structural precarity without contributing to the discourse that seeks to limit migrants' access to state protection in the form of asylum. In speaking about examples of direct violence, on the other hand, I also grappled with another set of questions around ethical representation. Many of the interlocutors I spoke with while I was conducting this research talked about their frustrations with foreign journalists and with academics who were solely interested in these salacious stories about gang violence and misery. And the repetition of these sensational stories of gang violence have had the effect of propping up the racist portrayal of central Central Americans as particularly violent or criminal, lending force to the discourse pushed by anti-immigrant interests in the US. These issues led me to reflect not only on how I speak or write about the reality of violence, but also about the tendency among journalists and academics to be drawn to sensational stories of violence over the complexities of the everyday, of both insecurity and of agency. And earlier today, when I was thinking about what I wanted to say in this presentation, I actually, I read an article that reminded me a lot of these issues, as well as the encouragement that I received from activists and from some of the families that I spoke, uh, that I spoke with to really seek to apprehend and reflect in my work, both the insecurity that has limited life chances uh, for so many in Central America, as well as the beauty and dignity of the place and the people. So this article was by um, uh, Salvadoran journalist, Roberto Lovato, in, it's published in the San Francisco Chronicle today. And uh, this article reflects on, or he's reflecting in this article on Joan Didion's 1983 book about the Salvadoran Civil War. And so I'm just going to quote him a couple of excerpts from the article just because I thought it was so spot on for what I wanted to say. So he says, um, today when I read Didion's phrase that terror is the given of the place, the much oft quoted phrase about my parents' homeland and about Salvadorans generally, the writer in me marvels before the luminescent power of words to carry and generate new meaning from, during, and beyond the darkest of times. Somehow, sometimes, however, the electricity of words can have a Frankenstein effect, making monsters of an entire people. Sadly, Didion's writings about us forgot a foundational fact of Salvadoran life, our humanity. And later in the article, he says, Didion concluded that terror is the given of the place after spending two weeks in El Salvador. After spending more than 56 years among my Salvadoran friends and family, I concluded that love is also the given of the place and of the people. So these comments from Lovato and from the interlocutors that I worked with pushed me to critically examine the tensions that are at play in seeking to represent the complexities of reality of, of violence and of vulnerability and of agency, particularly in a context in which these representations are highly politicized while also being constrained by legal frameworks like asylum that demand the repetition of simple stories of victimhood. And finally, and this is where I'll conclude, I also grappled with my own positioning in seeking to represent these stories as an engaged researcher. Here, I drew a lot in, my, in the way that I, I approached the study and how I approached trying to write about um, these stories that I heard. I drew from the work of Imogen Tyler and her approach to writing about the protests of detained migrant women in the UK. Um, Tyler explains that her aim is not to speak on behalf of the women in her article that she wrote about this, this one protest or to fix the meanings of their protests, but to think with the protests in order to speak back to theory or in this case, back to these prevailing hegemonic discourses. While I was conducting field work and literally traveling and marching alongside the protests of mothers of disappeared migrants, it was far easier for me to imagine myself as thinking with the protests and not as seeking to speak for. Since leaving the field and beginning the process of writing publications and speaking at events, I've, I've really been troubled by the slippage between these two positionings as standing, thinking, or speaking alongside uh, those that I seek to be in solidarity with in my work or speaking on behalf of. 
And this speaks, of course, to questions of reciprocity and relationship, which I also actively grapple with. But I remain really unsettled by the slippage between these positions and how we can responsibly navigate the meanings of thinking with a group of people uh, as opposed to speaking for in, in our writing and in our publications. And so there's uh, a lot more to say about all of these questions and many other questions that I haven't uh, mentioned yet, but I think I will leave it here um, for the discussion and turn it over to Michael. Thanks, Lisa. Um, hopefully y'all can hear me. Uh, I'm battling animal competition for attention while I stare at a computer screen, which is fun. Um, I'm just really excited for y'all to be here tonight and to, to be on a panel with Allison and Lisa. And I must admit that when I asked them to be on a panel on narrative responsibility, I had no idea what I meant by the term, but I really liked the idea of it. Uh, and we went from there and we've had some really great conversations over the the past few weeks trying to to get ready and, and it's exciting to to talk about this stuff because it, there's as i think allison kind of captured in the beginning there's a lot there and as, as lisa just made very very real uh it matters how you think about this stuff and how you put it into practice um so you know i'm going to work through this from uh, the perspective, not of a researcher, but really thinking in terms of, of what this looks like in, in teaching classes, uh, particularly conflict resolution courses. Uh, I think there's a, a and as I kind of thought through this more and more, there's really a difference uh, when you go to apply this concept in say a, a kind of intro to peace studies course uh, versus a conflict resolution course. Um, and I think that's where some of my my issue comes up is that I, I teach so many intro to conflict resolution courses uh, and I've been so kind of inspired by what narrative theory has has taught us about conflict uh, that the more I share with it and tell students how great it is uh, the more doubt it casts in me about how great it is uh, or the more kind of quandaries it raises where I'm like oh crap you know like I'm, I'm really happy people are learning this stuff uh, but in the same breath, oh, there's all these questions and I really hope they don't ask me because I don't have a good answer sitting there. So hopefully y'all will help us come up with some good answers. Um, so, you know, over the years, I've, I've certainly become increasingly anxious uh, about the extent to which I use other people's stories in my lessons. Um, and, and so, you know, kind of the turning point isn't really an original insight, um, but my hang up, if I can call it that, came when I said, all right, I'm going to try to save a little bit of time and I'm gonna use somebody's kind of pre-packaged role play uh, to teach some negotiation, right? Cause who's got time to write up a negotiation role play? Um, so I did a, a roommate conflict, which y'all are familiar with roommate conflicts. Uh, and of course uh, the scenario is that one of the roommates is a conservative bigot. Everybody else in the house is a tolerant liberal and oh, can't we just get the conservative bigot to realize they're a bigot. Um, right, the students, unsurprisingly, uh, balked at having to play the bigot. None of them ever want to play the person who's going to look bad. Um, and even when we would kind of get past the, oh, you can do this, you can step into somebody's shoes and, and tell their story the performances were terrible. It was like small town backwards hick uh, versus, you know, hip city dwelling liberals who uh, certainly fare better in the presentation. Um, and so, you know, I really started to get frustrated with myself, not the students, for assigning this and, and questioning, you know, what's the value uh, of, of assigning something uh, in which you have such simplistic representations of people, right? Because, you know, again, people, you don't have time to assign a whole book for somebody to prepare for a role play. Uh, but in the same breath, perhaps you could have a little bit more complexity there. And so trying to adopt some narrative, like insights from narrative theory and, and put them into practice, um, I started thinking, you know, maybe I needed to write my own. Um, role play scripts and maybe I needed to uh, kind of adopt things that would work better in this context if I wanted to be true to, to narrative work. 
Uh, certainly one argument could just be, uh, you should just scratch this approach uh, altogether uh, and do something more engaged. Um, and I'm in that regard, you know, I, I could certainly uh, follow something more along the lines of what Allison described in terms of eliciting stories from the students to work with. And I've got some exercises where I do that. Um, but I still believe in, in sadly the value of these role plays. Perhaps it's, you know, the trauma of, of having to go through conflict resolution programs where they do role plays with you for all of your graduate school. But I still think they're valuable. Um, but I've also been in context in which I would call them the not so engaged pedagogy in which, you know, the responsibility for learning in a role play is left all to the student rather than on uh, the teacher to help make these situations actually meaningful and, and for you to take something from them. Uh, and so I really wanted to kind of, you know, prevent the, the conflict resolution as anything goes impression that I think students walk out of some courses with, especially intro courses or skill building courses that don't necessarily focus on, you know, uh, making these uh, techniques practical. Uh, so what this meant for my teaching, right, is, is I'm trying to walk this line between both saying there is some, some place for what we talk about is banked knowledge, you know, kind of memorization of things such as fundamental concepts and skills, uh, while also trying to, to kind of do some engaged work uh, that we can kind of tease out critical analysis and, and self-reflection. So I started kind of developing stories and, and the challenge was, and, and this kind of goes back to the, the whole relationship that we're interested in between kind of complexity and responsibility. How do I develop complex storylines for these characters? And how do I root them in, in situations in which neither party can just kind of claim the moral high ground and the, the simulation be done? Um, so in pulling from my own experiences, uh, I thought it would be easier to make them actually map reality uh, and um, more difficult for students to kind of dismiss outright. I also thought it would be a way of kind of democratizing access to this information, right? That students wouldn't have to produce a story in which they were the expert and then have their classmates kind of have to figure out what was going on, but rather everybody's starting from this same foundation of information. Um, and, you know, then they could be free to be as harsh to the characters as they, they wanted to be in terms of their assessment. And the nice thing would be if they were being harsh and they had questions or they wanted to uh, know why a character did something, since most of these were mistakes I have made in my life, I could tell them, right? I could say, I don't know why I did this thing. I, you know, at the time I thought it was brilliant, but I'm a, well, we're recording, I'm a bleeping idiot. Um, right. Uh, so in that sense, right, I, I took really to heart this idea that narrative responsibility is intertwined with complexity. And then as a teacher, my duty was to really instill that basic insight. And so kind of following almost exactly what Allison said, right, that as people teaching conflict resolution, our job is to, to help folks recognize that when complexity is lost, when people are in conflict, and that loss of complexity opens the door to dehumanization, and thus violence and a, a further entrenchment of a conflict. So in theory, good conflict work, uh, we're going to develop the ability to sit with complexity, we're going to resist simplification, and, and we're going to kind of really work to do our, our shared humanity stuff as foundational for conflict resolution. So I was feeling good about narrative. I was feeling like I was, was integrating some things and blame this panel or, or the turn maybe on 2020 because why not? Everything else should be blamed on it as well. Um, but I have increasingly over the past year uh, really run up against some of the challenges that, that we're interested in talking about. And, and one of them is that we seem to be living in a moment in which the, the kind of positions and situations that we wanna portray that reflect what's going on in the real world, uh, that those stories, especially the, the stories about the, the kind of multiple crises we're dealing with uh, are reliant 
on their simplicity. And the characters who we would be saying, you know, you should play in this role play, you need to play a, a, a proud boy or a white supremacist, same thing. Uh, but right, that really those characters rely on that simplicity to kind of be who they are. Uh, and as such, <laughs> uh, they're really bad stories. They're awful, uh, but they're the stories, right? If I'm being responsible, uh, I'm acknowledging that that's the story these folks are telling. And so, you know, in kind of looking at that, you know, I started to, to think more about, you know, what are we supposed to do with stories that promote and celebrate fascism or racism or sexism, economic inequality, things that are all about division. Uh, should we try as good kind of conflict practitioners uh, to help folks add depth to those stories or complexity to those bad stories? Um, and in my experiments, <laughs> this only seems uh, to really kind of rationalize that person's or that story's intolerance and hatred of others. Uh, so it winds up turning what are really kind of clear violations of justice into misunderstandings or mistakes. And that's certainly not why I got into conflict resolution, right? I did not get in it so that somebody could tell me, uh, and I heard this multiple times while I was back in the Midwest, uh, uh, few days ago, uh, that people like George Floyd and Breonna Taylor got what they deserved. And that when I asked for complexity, when I tried to dig deeper into that story, uh, the assessment produced was an even nastier version of just full of victim blaming, right? There was nowhere for me to go in that story other than to, to kind of say, well, the original story sucked and the one you just told me is even worse. And I don't know how to, how to bring you in uh, because gee wow, uh, I don't agree with any part of what you've just said to me. <laughs> so rather than producing a deeper understanding of these situations, both of which in, in the case of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, clearly kind of rank in the realm of manslaughter. Uh, for me, narrative complexity started to run up against this kind of ethical dilemma of, you know, advancing the, the both siderism uh, that everybody's entitled to their story. So what have I, what have I been wrestling with? Well, what does the, the shift mean? And, and again, the shift for me is, is thinking, you know, well, is there another way to think about narrative responsibility? And, and I think in some ways, and this is a very uh, freshly mixed idea. So, so please do not look for me to have deep penetrating insights, but this seems to be where, where I'm being pushed uh, is this kind of move from, from an individual responsibility to maybe more so a collective responsibility. And that, that kind of against my earlier intentions, maybe the, the pedagogical demand specifically in these times uh, is to recognize that narrative simplicity uh, and rather than try to, to fix it, maybe to encourage these bad stories uh, because then we can at least label them as narratives that harm our humanity rather than advance it. And so, you know, the proposition uh, again might be that to leave bad stories as they are uh, or maybe more aggressively actively seek out and undermine or silence them. Uh, which is a horrible thing to, to kind of say if as um, very intelligent people who I respect, uh, like Sarah Cobb, define, you know, our ability to tell stories and narrate as the threshold for our humanity. Uh, can we violate that threshold uh, if a story itself runs against that? Um, and so, so maybe, you know, we can seek to understand a bad story. Uh, but maybe it's not our job or our mission to improve on it. Maybe, maybe, maybe we let that bad story sit. Uh, what that means in the classroom, though, is, is less clear to me. Uh, I'm certainly still bound to encourage students to think about how a story is told, uh, to embrace narrative complexity for tools of understanding how parties tell stories about themselves and others, and to recognize when people are telling, 
uh, kind of simplistic and counterproductive uh, narratives of the other. Uh, but I've also hit a threshold in, in which I, I cannot reasonably justify presenting bad stories as legitimate uh, or worthy of our care and attention beyond kind of recognizing that there are bad stories out there. Uh, and so the, the question I kind of wrote up because we all decided we were gonna toss questions at you all um, was the sense of, you know, is it, what responsibility do, do we then have as, as educators uh, to our students who tell bad stories and insist on their legitimacy? And, and any of you that I, I'm sure have taught courses over the past couple of years have had some students insist on telling some pretty god awful stories. Um, so yeah, I'll be quiet because we want to engage with y'all. Okay, so this is the thank you, Allison, Lisa, and Michael for your presentations. <laughs> um, before I open it up, I, you know, it's just a little, um, I want to ask to the panel if there's, if anybody wants to give any responses, initial responses to what's been said, um, or if you want to um, open it up to uh, the group right away. So um, I guess it's kind of like, Allison, do you know, Lisa, do you? <laughs> I think I'm good for opening up to the group. I think that we've put forth a bunch of questions and dilemmas that are ripe for everyone to engage with. So I'd love to hear what people have to think. Great. So um, just thank you to the presenters. And you know, I do think that there's been a, a, a wide net cast here on which direction um, this can go in and uh, there's so many examples to draw from. And if the group has more questions than comments, then we're happy to take questions as well um, in order to get the ball rolling on some of this stuff. And um, I definitely have um, some responses to um, Michael's question, but I'm, I'm afraid that'll end up you guys watching us have a conversation. So let's start off by opening the, the conversation to the group and uh, see where that goes. Does anybody, can we go into um, gallery mode and see who wants to talk? Is that possible? So that, I, I think both can really switch it over them. Gallery mode. Well, oh, no, she, there, there's a control where the, whoever's speaking is the one that's going to be on the screen. So is it possible? I turned off the spotlight so you guys can change yeah, it. Yeah, do you mind turning off the spotlight just for a minute? It, we'll see how it, see, we'll see how it goes. <laughs> yeah, I did. So you oh, you did. Oh, okay. So then I just need to change my own. Great. Any thoughts, comments? I, I'm happy to jump in. But All right, Wim. I don't like to be like the presumptuous white male who's like, let me start. <laughs> and, and, and that's one of the things I was going to say as an example for part of the narrative process is that there's a way in which like there's a settler mentality of like, you know, it's like colonizing a story, which is a different kind of metaphor than I um, heard you guys talking about. But yeah, that, that, that final question put me right in the grips of one of the more challenging dilemmas that I face is that so much of my life is boring and that like the experiences I've had, I don't feel like necessarily capture um, like a wide range of things like um, the experience of bias and discrimination and stuff so much as the people I know. And uh, so for the last several years, there have been auto ethnographies panels at PJSA as a way of like trying to have people tell their own stories and put more of that into the discussion. Um, and I guess two years ago, that, I mean, this is the, the example I really wanted to give uh, for Dr. English's question. Um, for the last couple of years, I've been really struggling with this, this singular detail of my pedagogy, which is that 
the best undergraduate paper I ever read or graded or worked with was from one of my students who is serving in a maximum security prison. And so part of what I like to do is encourage people who get the chance to go to jail to teach to do so because it's been in my experience like the best students you'll ever have like they are chomping at the bit to do every bit of homework and stuff and you're like these are literally the best students I've ever had. But in trying to talk about this paper and the points it raises and the impact that's had on me. I've never talked about the details that make the paper most significant, um, in part because that would reveal the inmate's identity, and I think that could be problematic in a number of ways. And by virtue of never talking about what makes the paper so brilliant, like it ends up just being like a oh, like when you're just bragging about teaching in jail. Um, and so that's been the biggest ethical challenge I've had is that like I really truly feel like sometimes you can't make the point you're wanting to make without revealing information that you may not be empowered for any number of reasons to share. It's kind of like when researchers think that they could have a breakthrough if they could only do this thing which totally is unethical. Um, and, and I think it gets back to the larger teaching part where I think if the story forgets some of the basic principles and like our responsibility to command or generate a safe space, um, like maybe that's the, the best guiding principle that I've come up with is that all other things aside, like safety first and um, asking students to role play the part of something that's traumatizing to them might serve some teaching point well it's still traumatizing to them right and like we just have to somehow put safety first um for better and for worse does anybody want to comment on that i i'm happy to comment on anything so um, y'all take the space because I don't, <laughs> um, I think from a, like from a narrative perspective, the idea of safety in the space is really hard for me. And there's, um, there's a way, and, and, you know, I, right now I'm working a lot with first year students where I'm required to create safe spaces so we can have hard conversations and I train student dialogue facilitators so that we can create a culture on campus where where dialogue and conversation aren't only happening in times of crisis, but so that we can be, build goodwill among each other. You know, and I, I don't mean to say it in a flippant way, it's just because I'm prattling about so that get through that part. Um, but when there's bad stories out there and dominant narratives that can come into the space at any time, and not everyone's aware of how those operate and how those circulate, um, it's really hard to create guidelines that make it because oftentimes the safety is dependent on each other respecting each other. Um, and I guess I just I grapple as I train students who have very, um, you know, in the same way as Michael's students have a hard time stepping into a narrative that isn't their own, especially one that they disagree with. Um, students don't have a lot of life experience to recognize when like an American dream narrative is getting plunked into the room, or if a white supremacist narrative is getting plunked into the room. And so then how does that space from a narrative perspective become safe, unless there's some kind of inoculation happening, or a direct um, recognition of the power that has just entered into the room regardless of how much I understand my social location and, you know, my identity and things like that. I don't know if anybody else has had that experience, but the minute a, a master narrative comes into the room, um, there's a, so much obligation there. Like there's so much obligation and leaving it, you know, that to me is then, you know, how do we create a safe space? How do we know that there's going to be the opportunity for that narrative to not get challenged and say, oh no, you can't think that way because that wouldn't work. 
but to recognize how narratives move in the world and get anchored into local conversations. And that's why I have, and I'm coming from a very particular standpoint right now that isn't just as a teacher, but as this person who's promoting dialogue on my campus, <laughs> you know, and saying like, oh, wow, how do you manage that? Because the minute it plunks in the room, the minute it drops in, guess what people do? They get frozen. They're like, oh my God, did you guys hear that? Somebody quick, dash over it. Somebody gloss over it really quick. Say something else. It's more personal, like your own experience. Matt is struggling with grading in general, instructional design for this reason, maybe an inoculated grading technique. <laughs> oh my gosh. I, I'm not to like sure exactly what you mean. Does anybody want to pick up on that? I, I can, I'm sorry, I, I can uh, sort of expand a bit. Um, yeah, no, I, I, I wonder, because when you're sort of um, tasked with structuring the space and the time, um, it seems like there's a lot of responsibility in that. And then, you know, talking about that master narrative and and grading and, and kind of what is, uh, you know, the standard that is being set seems, um, you know, there's a lot of ethical responsibility and there's a lot of history and culture and, and all of this bound up together. And, um, and going with that settler colonial sort of industrial capitalist, you know, name whatever uh, adjective you want to that. Um, but it's, it, that's the power dynamic that is reproducing itself through through how we grade, how we instruct and design and, and all of the sort of unconscious infrastructure that allows for that space to be structured as it is. So um, it's it's always something to be critical about, right? Like, uh, you know, is like Zoom uh, in general, if everybody's moving there or smart boards or, you know, the the industrial factories that are producing the pencils and, and smart, you know, Chromebooks, whatever. So it's um, it's all very, you know, um, uh, suspect and entangled and, 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 you know, woven with these other things. Anyway, so that's kind of uh, where my mind sort of <laughs> can get us. But um, yeah, happy to hear others. Can I jump in for a second? Because yes. Matt, Matt raised something for me. I mean, I do consciously, in terms of instructional design, and I think this goes back to why I'm so committed at some level to having <coughs> some banking elements. Excuse the puppy. Not sure what he's excited about. Um, that there are just things that I can let the students do grade-wise that they don't feel like I'm evaluating them based on what they say in class. Even the, the experiential stuff is based on participation or completion of a, of a self-assessment or something in that regard um, so that they have space to not feel like the, the content of their stories is the thing I'm going to nitpick at. I don't think it's perfect, but, but like it's, it's, I, I can feel you and, and feel that I'm like, I, I purposely try to separate the grade and the stuff you do for the grade in some way from the, the conversational stuff that I really care about, but that they might not care as much about because they're students and they've been told to care about the grade. Sure, no, and, and absolutely, and that's what it should be. But even then, it, it seems like, you know, what is it that you're going to sort of emphasize and what is it that you're going to sort of help and like the direction and the process and the end goal and all of that stuff, so. Um, but yeah, no, that's, that's absolutely great. Thank you. Well, I think one of the interesting things that is being pointed out is just how even the, the system or the, the way in which the spaces that we're talking about, whether it's the, the space of the conversation of you know, migrants and how that gets framed within a particular set of discursive, systemic dis discursive practices, versus the classroom, which also is embedded within layers of, you know, systemic discursive practices. <laughs> and that um, it just highlights how much these 
this narrative of responsibility is happening within a particular context in which we're all navigating and we're all caught up in it, right? And I think that's that's something that I think is really just being highlighted here, even as we get into like the microcosm of the moment in the classroom versus talking about these really entrenched discourses happening at national level about migrants and then what's happening, you know, how that's anchored into local processes for their lived experience on the, on the, um, in the caravans, right? So I don't know, I'm just seeing this, the ways in which this is um, paralleled. Yeah. Um, we have Katie says that regarding the idea of safe spaces, Arayo and Clemens have written a paper on safe spaces versus brave spaces that is really interesting and talks about how safety is often conflated with feeling comfortable and leads to the replication of dominance. See some heads nodding. Uh, I was going to make a question, a question or comment. Uh, if it's all right, I was listening to all of your presentations, and there's so many, so many things that could be said. But I do want to say that I find myself in the classroom. I want to challenge the, the dominant narratives and bring in voices that have been marginalized. And so I have all those questions you mentioned, Allison, about. Am I doing it the right way? You know, who am I to decide how to bring these voices in? But I, I try to do it responsibly. But then I have some students who just, you know, flat out uh, re reject or feel defensive when I do something uh, like that. And it's, that's also a challenge. And I wanted to give a couple examples. And I don't know if any of you have any advice or something. So I've been using uh, Brian Van Norden's Taking Back Philosophy for teaching in my philosophy classes. And he argues that the usual story told about the history of philosophy is a narrow Eurocentric story that basically stereotypes philosophies from India and China and, and says flat untruths about them. Uh, you know, acting like the, the other traditions are somehow illogical or mystical or something. And, uh, and he gives so many good concrete examples. But then he links this to what he calls, what he thinks is a anti-intellectualism that he finds in contemporary America. And of course he refers to Trump and he refers to people, you know, Bible people who think, you know, the world was created in seven days, who reject evolution, etc. And so then what happens is the students who are Trump supporters suddenly feel like they've been marginalized and victimized by this unfair narrative about themselves, you know, and it's it's just crazy how, you know, they can all suddenly be on the defensive and woe and me, my professor, you know, is, is marginalizing me. And if I ask them, okay, you tell me, what is Trump done? Well, he's doing magic for the economy or something. That's why he's so great. He can't say, you know, he's not an anti until, you know, they don't, they don't address the issue of philosophy, you know, they just say their defensive things about Trump. And the, so, Michael, what, what you were saying, some of the things you were saying on this was reminding me. And it's like, you know, how do I challenge this false story? And are they going to cling to the false story about philosophy only being written by, you know, white Europeans because they think that's a Trump thing and it's not a liberal thing and there's only two sides. And uh, so, so these are some of the frustrations I have. And then when it comes to migrants, I mean, I used the book, uh, Jose Antonio Orozco, Toppling the Melting Pot. And he went into great detail about the long history of our country's 
uh, demonizing of immigrants, you know, it's like every 30, 40 years they do it again, you know, and how we need a more nuanced story about who are Americans and realize all these Americans are contributing to American democracy, not demolishing it. And I still had one student, she actually said she read the book from cover to cover. And then she had such negative things about it. He's trying to destroy America, et cetera, et cetera. And it's like, how can you read this book? It's all about challenging these falsities, the simplistic narrative, uh, embracing the complex story, and then you reject it straight off. Like, no, that's wrong. My story is right, you know? And, and it was so frustrating. She kept saying, and my best friend is a Latina, so I'm not a racist, you know? And, and it's like, you know, these are the challenges we have in, in the classroom, you know? And so my question is just, well, first of all, I wanna thank you all because you're raising important issues, but I don't know if there's any easy answer but these are the challenges I often find uh, in the classroom. Anyone want to step in on this? Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna step. I'm gonna do it. I'm so nervous. Okay, so hi. Um, I have no clue um, how I'm going to respond to any of that, but I, I, I will just start by saying um, I think it's all, as all of you know, is it's all about the context. So I'm going to provide my context because it's the only thing I know about. Um, so um, I'm looking at um, Psicologian Filipino, which is a Filipino psychology. So it's taken by this man named Virgilio Aguilar. He studied in the US. Um, in the 70s, he moved over to the Philippines, I'm sure. Some of you have already read his work. Um, and he talks about uh, this particular methodology called cuento cuentohan. A cuento is a story. Um, and cuento cuentohan, when you repeat the word, it means, it makes that a bit playful. Um, it, it usually adds some sort of depth of, or playfulness to something, so you, or, or, or importance, okay? Um, uh, and I, I, it's interesting to me because this particular methodology in the 70s talked about how much of what, much of our psyche gets exposed within this space of cuento cuentohan. Now a direct translation is telling stories, but it's not telling stories. It's actually sitting around, I don't know, in the kitchen, in a bar, right? Pretty much what we did, like when we entered Zoom and we just randomly talked about anything, that's cuento cuento han, okay? So pretty much is the, the non-controlled spaces of being. And when this happens, which is completely uncontrolled and you're not able to, to dialogue this, you're not able to capture it, you're not able to record it, you're not able to use it for your paper. I mean, it's just because, you know, it's not official yet, right? We haven't signed the papers that we need to sign in order to say that you can use the story. This is where the real problems or issues that we grapple with as Filipinos shine. And I'm gonna say this now, many, if not all, will, we sometimes have a really hard tendency, and I'm not speaking for all Filipinos, but I'm a second generation Filipino Canadian. Um, uh, and, and so I do have a little bit of, I do feel like I can, I can say it a little bit more than um, let's say a first generation, not that there's a difference per se, but uh, what we say to non-Filipinos is completely different than what we would say to Filipinos. And I don't know why, and I, and I know, and, I, and actually it's a conscious thing now for me, but it, it wasn't so conscious before. It's a switch that you do. It's kind of like the difference between you talking to your grandmother and you talking to your girlfriend. You don't make that constant, you know, you don't actually say, oh, I'm talking to my grandmother right now. I'm gonna make sure I don't talk about last night, right? You don't do that. You just don't do it unless you have a really awesome relationship with your grandmother, in which case 
wonderful on you. Um, and then you can really have cuento cuentohan, right? Then it's then the whole thing explodes. There's the complexity of the context. So um, I just, I guess what I'm bringing to the table is if we want to create the safe space, uh, what if the safest space is the one that we can't really put our finger on in, a, in an academic sense, right? In, in, in terms of the current methods that we have to do. So when we mine for narratives and when we collect for narratives, you know, um, I've gone through works where um, the voices that have come from certain members of the Filipino community are very much the voices that we would just give um, to, someone because we think that's what they want to hear. Um, and, and, and some people will actually think that is my voice because they're still at the level of uncovering or discovering the trauma. They haven't even, you know, it's almost like a level of, of, of the, the level of the narrative that, that we're collecting is still that level of um, the healing mechanism or the recognition mechanism. Um, so it's not the kind of uh, narrative trauma I'm collecting to heal yet, but it's almost like it has to create some sort of dissonance, right? It has to challenge what they're thinking. And I guess my ethical issue now is, so if I have to do that in order to shift the discourse of Filipino diaspora, especially in North America, then, um, then people are not going to want to uh, discover that voice, right? That's a really difficult place to put somebody in. And so ethically speaking, um, can I even do that, right? It's quite, what Wilma's saying is like, do I even, you know, that space, you know, that's the most difficult space is where the answers are. How do we navigate that? So maybe this idea of cuento cuentohan and like oral documentation, maybe it's getting us a little bit closer to getting us as the researcher away, because sometimes it's hard to not advocate for like what we believe is right, right? Like telling that story. And it's hard to let go and say, well, that's his journey, right? I mean, he's a white supremacist, that's his journey, that's his narrative, we gotta let it go, it's, that's his path, right? But that's hard, so, sorry. Thank you and sorry. No apology necessary, that was great. Could you spell that out so that I can make sure I have the, the term correct? Can you put it in the chat? Great. I could just take like 30 seconds to say uh, the last two comments. Um, what you've done for me, and this doesn't have to like change or shift the conversation at all, but that on the one hand, I was familiar with this idea that we should have a distinction between comfort and safety. What I have to do is really re-examine what does comfort mean and what does safety mean? So my syllabus says I promise safety, but not comfort. Now I have to decide what that actually means. So thank you both. Gail, I just wanted to respond to, to the kind of point you raised at the end, because I've definitely, I, I find that situation more and more with say the, the, the resistance to any kind of shift in the, the dominant narrative, right? Any, anything that, that upsets it, if you identify with that narrative, it seems you are in, increasingly sensitive to someone challenging it and it's it's strange because i would at least say when when from my own experience when trump first got elected i could find myself talking to conservative students because i could at least kind of step into their world and say i could see what you saw in him in opposition to say hillary clinton 
right? I can I can articulate what those reasons were, um, or you know, again, not in the sense of, of of needing to believe it, but I could believably stand in front of a class and say, this position, I get right. Does this sound like your story? Um, and I really found that I, I can't do that, that within the kind of three and a half years we've been doing that, it feels like the story has really kind of swung even further in a direction in, in which before it was um, distasteful, but not necessarily unpalatable. <laughs> and, and now it's in this land of like, I, I can't even reiterate the positions you want me to reiterate because it seems like you've also reformulated the narrative to to go on the journey over to this corner that's a really ugly corner of space that I don't want to be in um which is hard because you know again I I had moments I can reflect on moments in which the the kind of multiple stories about 2016 could exist at the same time uh that I don't think are capable of existing in the same space in 2020. I, I can't resist but mentioning this because I saw it in the news today. But you know, we've all heard this big news today about, you know, Trump has coronavirus. And I heard, uh, you know, various uh, people talk, talk about, you know, what it means and Naomi Klein was talking on democracy now what she thinks and it's she had some interesting metaphors but um, I I also get all these daily emails from whitehouse.gov which is from you know Trump administration as their spin on the five news stories they think that Trump's followers should look at every day and most days I try to glance at it so that I know, you know, or I get some small glimpse at, you know, what does it look like from their point of view? And there's five news stories not even mentioning that Trump has coronavirus. So, I mean, his illness didn't even make the top five, you know, and Naomi Klein, she argued that Trump has been presenting himself as this like genetic Superman who, you know, doesn't have to worry about getting coronavirus. And I thought, could it be that he'll get it? But a bunch of his followers won't even know because they never look at the mainstream media. They only look at what he sends them or how, how is he gonna justify just not mentioning this to his own followers? But so far today, I didn't see him do it. I don't know. Maybe he's taken off to some other way, but um, there's just such an interest in what's said and what's not said in the way two sides try to shape their very different narratives. Um, so I used to teach, and I'm going to again, which I'm really looking forward to, introduction to conflict analysis and resolution from a discursive perspective. And in that class, I well, I used to teach at CU Boulder, where I had a much different student body than I do now at Regis, which, you know, just the nature of the institutions are just very different. And uh, I used to worry because I had so many people who were part of the military in my classes. And so I'm like, oh, they, they must be taking this. I don't know why, you know, I don't know what their story is really why they're, they're taking this class. Um, but here I am kind of not wanting to, you know, reveal, you know, exactly where I stand on issues. Um, and in the Four semesters that I taught it there, I never had any pushback from conservative students um, in my class. And I, you know, have been curious about that. And part of it is because I never talk about the people. I'm always talking about the narratives and how 
particular narratives operate in conflict. And then we can say, here's the framework, here's how it works. And like, where do we see this? How do we see this operating? How do we see this happening? And nobody has to be guilty of ascribing to that narrative. It's merely an analysis. And it, when I'm thinking about it, it reminds me of some narrative work by, especially by John, John Winslade, who draws off of Michael White um, in talking about how can we, in the work that we do, separate people from the problem so that we're talking about the problem and not ascribing it to individuals. And if we're able to, which is not easy work, but if we're able to do that, then people can see the problem as it is and then not necessarily have to tell on themselves, right? Um, and I'm, I wonder, I haven't fully, you know, um, done an, you know, a full analysis of this, but I actually have had people enlisting, moving on into, one person in particular was going into the army, another person was going into to like um, strategic operations, but tell me that he felt so glad that he understood the institution better that he was going to be, you know, supporting. And I thought, holy crap. That's like, <laughs> wow, okay, something, something worked there where we talked about perpetrator narratives, victim narratives, um, battle discourses, war discourses, um, and wrote papers about them. And they had to do an analysis of a conflict from all these different perspectives. And the only thing that I land on is that when we make it about individuals, we get stuck trying to analyze an individual, but we were talking before about all of this stuff. Then it's a narrative system that we're all embedded in. You know, so that's why I say I get nervous when the American dream comes in the room, right? Because not everybody understands the history of that. But once we, you know, talk about the history of that and then decode it a little bit and talk about how, what that reinforces, it's like, oh, wow. Um, and now I'm not saying that your student who read an entire book about migrants, you know, I, I mean, there's to an certain extent, like, okay, outlier, you know, like, you know, even in the, the work that we do to, to educate and try to open up the complexity of what we understand as our history and the relationships that we have with, you know, people, you know, the, 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 the diversity of humans that inhabit our country and how we treat them. Um, yeah, I like there's just a point where I'm like, okay, that person is on a journey that, you know, isn't ready for the shift right now. And who knows, maybe later, but I try not to lose sleep over the one, you know, noisy person in the room, even though because that's the one, you know, that you're going to pay most attention to because of how noisy they are. But anyway, I guess mostly it was to say that one of the ways that I'm, and I'm, I'm, uh, let's see, uh, when you, I'm like honing this skill, like I've been practicing it for a long time and every class I'm like, okay, how can I do that better? You know, what's, what, what are some of the bigger stories that really, really operate in our system that I can help deconstruct? Um, and I like, it, it's a work in progress for sure, but I was shocked at the, the way in which uh, military people were receptive to it. I mean, in fact, last week, a woman who sat in front of me and she's like, the Air Force didn't work out for me. And I remember your class and I was hoping you could talk to me about X, Y, Z. And I'm like, oh, that's amazing. Anyway, that was a bit of a ramble, but yeah, Lisa. Hey, Allison, I, was, I just wanted to say, I've been a little bit quiet on the point of, of responding to some of these master narratives coming up in class, especially um, a bit less teaching experience than you folks. And also my, my courses tend to be upper level women and gender studies courses. So I don't tend to run into as many Trump supporters. <laughs> it's a bit of a self-selecting space in that, in that sense. But um, anyways, I, I like the idea that you're bringing up here and talking kind of shifting focusing in or reframing, shifting away from the discussion of an individual into this point, Gail, um, I can see how that would be really, you can get stuck in that back and forth in a class and trying to convince 
the student and Trump has become such a polarizing figure and nothing is really concrete or certain because there's just, there are so many lies and conflicting narratives and that are, that are being circulated right now. And so to be able to, to somebody who's really wrapped up in that, I could see that being an impossibility, not, all, not to mention the fact that then you have to redirect the classroom attention around this one person and spend all of this time on, you know, centering whiteness and this, 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 you know, the discourses that are emanating around this and you're putting out potentially a lot of venom into the middle of the class. I don't speak so much on, um, on narrative, but on discourse and structure, but I can see the benefit in trying to, if possible, of getting away even from the name Trump, you know, or the individual Trump and just trying to shift it back in the way that, that Allison's talking about to these broader structures or these narratives that kind of takes the identification away and perhaps the allegiance away from one individual person to talk like, like exactly Allison, as you say, that we, none of us have to be guilty necessarily if we're talking or perhaps less guilty, we're less called out if we're able to talk about how this power operates on these different levels of structure and discourse. So I, I know that that perhaps doesn't work on every single, in every single circumstance, uh, as you're talking about with this, this student who really doesn't want to get the point of the book. <laughs> but maybe that's a way of shifting away from this kind of battle back and forth between you and one student on the topic of Trump, which is, well, is one of those entrenched issues, right? I, I have to admit, I was at a conference with uh, Brian Van Norden, who wrote this book that I've been teaching for a few semesters. And I told him that one of the difficult things about the book is that he uses Trump as a key example in a couple of the chapters. And you know, he wrote the book in 2016, and it was sent to the publisher before Trump won. And Van Norden said, I had no idea he would really win the election when I wrote what I did, you know. And so that was kind of funny to realize. But like, on the one hand, some students in the class really appreciated all his concrete examples from Trump and the Republicans and the things they do. The problem is the other part of the class resented those concrete examples. And so uh, maybe a book a book covering the same topic that doesn't focus so much on Trump, maybe that's what will be needed in future years. But I did have some students appreciating this is a cutting edge philosophy book talking about what we're going through right now. I mean, many of my students said that about the book too. So that's, that's one of the pros and cons. But I do appreciate your idea, Allison. Just talk about these, these are the narratives that are being used and focus on the narratives and not the personalities is one way to circumvent a focus on Trump that could be too sidetracking. It's true. And another thing my students did is if they didn't like the book because of what it said about Trump, they felt like it justified their dismissing everything he said on every other topic. They just said, well, clearly he's biased, right? Even if he had, he's like a specialist in Chinese philosophy and he had everything footnoted. It's like they dismissed him in one fell swoop. It, maybe it happens to me too. But so it is a challenge to figure out how to, something of critical about these narratives without students just dismissing you all together, how to get them to really grapple with it and see that they'll be better off if they rethink these things than, uh, than cling to the simpler narratives. 
I also just wanted to say for two seconds that Jen, I really loved the the story that you told and the points that you made. And it's just, I don't have a really cohesive uh, response to you right now, but it's getting the wheels turning in my mind of thinking about what this what this looks like um, in research and practice and classroom. And yeah, it, it was it was a really fine point. I like that quite a lot. Well, thank you all for uh, giving the space to share. You created a safe space. I was pretty, I was pretty terrified. So that was well done. <laughs> Good job, guys. Can I just say something about Trump? It's kind of like that word. And, and I think narrative, there's a lot of language issues too that we have to deal with, you know, as like narrative researchers, I guess you could say. Um, so I think of the word Trump and then, you know, when you hear that word, how do you feel when you hear that word? And so everybody is going to respond to Trump in a completely different way. So like if, and this is very simplified, right? Like a completely simplified, but um, you know, if you, uh, if say Trump in Istanbul, they're gonna think of like this massive tower um, and shiny gold things. Um, if you say Trump to um, uh, a boy, then he's going to uh, get all excited and his heart's gonna race. And you know, um, if you say Trump to, um, uh, you know, somebody else and they might react a different way or that, 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 that name or that we've, we've put so much, there's so much invested emotional investment put into that word because we've just, we've, we've made it as, as this thing that we all talk about all the time because it just exists. Um, so interesting if, if it's not so much like how we control it, but just to recognize that, that it is like he, the, the word will conjure up all of those things to everyone and it's just the way it is and there's nothing really we can do about it unfortunately maybe that's I don't know just throwing that yeah I think it's really important to you know especially when talking about like when we're working with stories we're talking about you know, or even when you say Trump, I think what you're hinting at is that a story gets told for each person who hears that word, right? And there's a there's a whole story around that word and the people are gonna react depending on the story that they attach to that word, right? So we're talking about like, how do meaning systems get created? And then how do we understand the different meaning systems that get attached to a story or even a word or a symbol that ends up expressing a story um, that is, as you say, context-based depending on the experience of the individual who's either telling it or hearing it, right? And I think that's partially, you know, I think that's what's happening, for example, in, in your class, Gail. Um, and also um, when I had articulated that uh, my students at CU Boulder have had a different experience than my students at Regis, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of coming to this understanding about this story that gets ascribed because at Regis, there's an explicit social justice mission, right? So when I come into my classes now, I've, I've as a part of my acculturation to Regis, started to talking more about social justice than narrative, even though my work in narrative is all about power relationships and addressing systems of marginalization and dehumanization. And now I'm wondering, and I, and I think this might be the case, is that social justice is a bit, it's much more loaded than narrative. Um, students don't really know what narrative means, but I'm wondering, and it, I, it's like, I'm not even wondering, I'm coming to this conclusion <laughs> that the approach from a social justice perspective is already now positioning people in particular kinds of way vis-a-vis -a, a, a, a problem that there's some people who are on one side of the justice and there's some people who are on the other side of the justice. Whereas when I, when I was teaching from a narrative lens, we were all talking about the narratives that we're caught up in. And so when I said before that I'm getting better at it and practicing, I'm actually recognizing that I remember when I was in graduate school and I'm like, oh my God, this narrative stuff is so liberating because I'm doing social justice work and I'm not talking about social justice. It's like sneaky. And then now here I am years later coming into this institution 
And I'm like reverting back into that language and realizing it's not, it's actually not working as well. It's not having the same purchase. It's not having the same currency for students to feel um, like they can take up the story because, you know, the, you know, the minute you say activist, right? What happens? Whole story gets, whole story gets, you know, Anyway, so I, I'm really taking your point to heart. Just, you know, it's, it's helping me even figure out in a deeper way what's going on when, you know, meaning systems get attached when you, when you say certain things or invoke certain things in, into a telling or, yeah. To, to jump onto that and another point that I think came up in some of the presentations, um, then you have the, the, the resistance to kind of the idea that our role pay plays that we're so happy, happy to use because they provide the safety of students being able to practice whatever their conflict skills or something without having to be their own authentic selves, but actually every time that they're being asked to pretend that there's somebody else. They're being disempowered from being their authentic selves and. And it's like, it's so intuitive, right? Like you said, it's so liberating. The narrative thing about like, this is my story to share. Like it feels good. And at the same time, it's like, then we get like valid validated as scientists. The moment we find like the P values to prove that we have strong statistical evidence that, you know, supports something that we've known all along, which is like, who are we believing and why aren't we believing ourselves? Jen, I was thinking about what you said about how, you know, we express ourselves differently based on who we're talking to and that you might say to another Filipino person something more candid or in a different way than someone else. But, you know, there are some people who catch those kinds of candid expressions in writing or I guess in recording and then share them with a greater audience beyond what was first envisioned. And of course, uh, even this session, maybe it, it's going to happen to this session. I'm talking to you all and who knows who's going to watch it later. But I'm thinking of, I have this friend, Ethram, and he made a whole book out of immigrant narratives. And uh, he did a reading of his book, but it's called The Border Patrol Ate My Dust. And it was all narratives. That basically, there was a radio station and, uh, and the, the woman on the radio station, Alicia Alarcon, she said, call in and tell us your story. And everyone told the story about, I tried to cross the border here and I almost got caught and then I went here or I got caught the first time and I went back the second time. And, and the stories were originally told in Spanish, but Ethereum was able to translate them and I can read them and my students can hear them and the students never would have been imagined as the first audience in the first telling of the story. So there's the whole question of how does the storyteller feel? Oh, I didn't have a chance to change my story because I didn't realize who the whole audience was going to be. But no, it's already been recorded. Now it's being shared. What about that aspect of the narrative? On the one hand, maybe now my students will get an insight into what it's like being an immigrant and they never would have had that insight before. On the other hand, does the original narrator feel like, oh my God, you know? I mean, the same thing can happen with those oral history uh, archives. I remember running into a guy and said, oh, yes, your, your uh, interviews in the uh, Arab American Museum oral history archive. He goes, 
uh, every time I think of all the things I told that lady, I can't believe it, you know. Um, so there's always, is there the, you know, the regrets about the candid narration or, you know, in what ways do we get to know each other better? Or can we not understand each other because the context is too different and I'll never know really what you meant because I don't have, you know, the cultural details to really understand what you meant in your context. So when I hear it in my context, I don't know what's being said. I mean, those are all also big questions with narrative and storytelling. Absolutely. And I just realized that we're five minutes over time. So um, thank you so much for coming and helping make this conversation so rich and interesting. Thank you to the presenters for making this space possible. And thank you to PGSA for hosting this. And um, if anybody wants to keep in touch, um, I bet we'll have a, I don't know, will we have, well, this is recorded, but I don't know, you can, we can find each other. Um, uh, thank you, everyone. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Allison. Thank you. Uh, sorry, I didn't catch the name of our facilitator, our conference facilitator before.